Welcome to Construction Genius, and my guest today is Mark Gravely. Mark is an attorney based out of Texas, and he is the author of the book Reframing America's Infrastructure, A Ruins to Renaissance Playbook. Mark has a deep interest in the history of infrastructure in the United States and the future of infrastructure. And since I know that contractors share a similar interest, particularly in the future of infrastructure, I thought I'd bring Mark on to discuss what's broken about the infrastructure here in America and specific things we can do to fix that with a view to how contractors can get on the front foot, get out in front of some of the innovations that are happening so that they can take advantage of them, they can influence those innovations, and together we can do what we can to strengthen the infrastructure of our country. Enjoy my interview with Mark. Feel free to share that with other people who you think would benefit from hearing uh, this interview. And as always, please give Construction Genius a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and enjoy my conversation with Mark. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Mark, welcome to Construction Genius. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me, man. It's my pleasure. Um, you have a book out called Reframing America's Infrastructure, A Ruins to Renaissance Playbook. In your mind, as you've done a lot of thinking around this, your book is quite extensive, but why do you why do you think our infrastructure is broken here in the United States? Well, you know, Eric, a lot of it's not broken, but there's a fair amount of it that is, and probably more that is than people would like to comfortably think about. Hmm. You know, um, Bridges shouldn't collapse. I think that's something we can all agree on. Uh, you know, buildings should be energy efficient. Things should be done in a thoughtful manner. And so that doesn't always happen. You know, uh, people go about building or designing parts of the infrastructure, whether it be you know, roads or bridges, uh, buildings, uh, parks, even uh, power grids. It's all part of our infrastructure. It's the it's the structure and the substance of our daily lives when we're outside of our homes. Mm. And so, you know, there's a lot of it that's right. Um, you know, the planning and execution on the interstate highway system was miraculous. Uh, you know, when the federal government passed the law that said, hey, here's what we're going to do. Um, President Eisenhower, you know, signed it into law. That increased the efficiencies that we have of transportation and transporting products. A lot of people don't really think of that. Think about it like that. Can I ask you this? Let me just take you back in time there. Eisenhower, that's going to be in the early 50s? Just after World War II, yeah. Okay, so, okay, just after World War II. Tell me, why do you think that went forward at that time where, you know, when we think of infrastructure these days, all we think of is gridlock and, you know, promises, you know, something was supposed to happen under Trump, nothing really happened. Something's supposed to happen under Biden, nothing's happening yet. Why under Ike did it move forward? So, you know, it took the federal government and, and a lot of vision to get that going. But the fact is, after World War II, everyone was united. Yeah. And the American people, uh, such as we were, were united in effort. And it was a time for fresh ideas. If you'll recall, there was a lot of technology that was used and that came out of and that was developed during and after World War II. I mean, for goodness sake, the atomic bomb, the B-2 rocket, uh, sure. you know, uh, tanks, submarines. Yep. And so people were uh, accustomed to seeing great leaps in technology and the idea that we could have our own American Autobahn yep. uh, or you know, an extensive system appeal to people. It appealed to business. And so uh, there was the political will to get it done. And that's one of the huge reasons that it, it got passed. I don't know what the vote was. You know, on the House floor, there's so many of those these days that don't count. Uh, but you know, there, the will of the people was there, and, and we had a leader who uh, was allowed to lead. So it's interesting because, um, you know, we, we we were promised flying cars, and all we got was an iPhone. And, you know, the iPhones are cool, you know, and I was just goofing around on um, the, the latest AI, uh, uh, chat AI, 
that's it's really cool but you know it's not like it's not revolutionizing or dramatically transforming people's lives so what technologies do you think are underutilized at the moment that could have a tremendous positive impact on the building of our infrastructure or the rebuilding of it well there's a couple things depending on the infrastructure you're talking about for example the texas power grid i'll use texas as an example right it's one of, our, one of our biggest states uh you know a lot of personality everybody likes to watch what's going on in texas sometimes and the power grid was having some problems when a lot of people needed power a few winters ago yep and so the design of that in texas by the way is the only state who has a standalone power grid. Hmm. Uh, and so it's a great example, both in a, a positive way and a negative way. And so uh, the, the algorithms or the decision trees used to make design decisions on power grids uh, are uh, a, a one big thing, maybe a more advanced version of uh, AI that you've got on your, on your app there. You know, that can contribute to the, uh, 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 the constructive design uh, of a power grid. Um, let's not forget much of the power grid was installed decades ago, designed decades even before. And so it's an old design that doesn't really take advantage of a lot of new technologies. So, um, you know, that's one thing. That's one example, I think, from the question you asked. So then let me ask you about then the, the political structure, and if you have any views on this. Obviously, um, you know, we have the, the, the federal government, we have the state governments. Can you think of a state that is doing more positive work on infrastructure rebuilding in comparison with the other states here in America? Well, uh, sure. Uh, California is doing a lot of great things. They're trying to diversify their uh, energy usage. Uh, they frankly lead the nation in um, uh, better building techniques, more stringent uh, code. Look, the fact is, is that uh, whether you believe uh, greenhouse gases and global warming and climate change. Uh, that aside, buildings use too much energy and they let too much of it out. So when you heat them or cool them, a lot of it escapes through the envelope. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, my father repeatedly asked me and reminded me to close the front door because, quote, we're not heating the damn neighborhood. <laughs> quote, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> We're not cooling the front street, so yeah, right. yeah. So you know, I think anyone that's ever been a you know grown up uh, has had that. So that's what's that's what happens when you don't have a building that is energy efficient. And California's led the way on that. It's and interesting. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you know, yes, it's a little more expensive, and yes, it takes longer to build, and you know, yes, it's a little more of a headache. But that's just one example of some things that commercial builders, both residential residential and commercial have to do if we're going to you know lessen our uh, energy use i think we can all agree that using less energy is better if we can do it you know i hear people all the time say well we've got you know 400 years worth of coal left or you know 2000 years worth of oil you know how about we start being more efficient now so our great 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 grandchildren you know uh, can still use some of that uh, along with the alternative methods that get developed along the way um, I'm, I'm curious about California because I actually I live in California and one of the things I do is I, I'm in Sacramento and so I drive down the uh, the 99 um, and go down to LA at times or just the Central Valley visiting my clients and as I'm as I'm going down the the, the southern part of the Central Valley I see the uh, the uh, high speed rail railroad and what I see is not the high speed railroad but I see this chunk of overpass that they've built. And that's all they've built. And it's like, you know, it's out in the middle of nowhere, basically going nowhere. And to me, that's a testament of a lot of the, uh, to a lot of the challenges that we have with the infrastructure uh, rebuilding or renaissance, as you call it in America, is just this, the, the, the high, high costs. And I understand there's high costs involved with some of these, you know, regulations and stuff, but the high costs of building combined with the political gridlock. And, you know, every time we talk about infrastructure, people say, yeah, that would be nice. But Mark, you know, it's just not happening. Well, so, you know, so I'm not going to jump on your bandwagon. Uh, okay, good. You know, let's, you know, let's be fair. Okay. Uh, in China, when they want to build a light rail from Beijing to Mongolia, they just do it because nobody owns any property there. Right. Government owns the land. So when they want to dictate that that gets built, well, uh, they just do it. And we've seen uh, great and fantastic things from uh, Chinese construction and long range planning. 
Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative. Sure. Um, you know, I'm sure they're running into some financial problems, but the fact is, is that somebody there has had the vision to pull this damn thing off and it's happening. OK, they're tying themselves to their neighboring countries and building, you know, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, a super highway system with which to trade and travel. And we know what happens when you do that. Uh, you become greater than the sum of the parts. You tie people together with uh, different views, different things to buy and sell. And you communicate with people. Uh, people get to go see their relatives who live in neighboring you know, states or countries. So, um, so I need to disagree with you when you say you see part of a bridge that's been built and think, ah, oh, gridlock. Uh, you know, light rail is appropriate for some areas of the country here in the United States, and it's not appropriate for others, uh, you know, given the population densities. And in some places it's going to work, and in some places it'll be built, and you know, maybe it won't, but. By gosh, we've got to try. But the first thing we have to do is negotiate with people who own the land because this is America after all. And we take the good with the bad. We're all here together, uh, in my view. And so, you know, you've got to buy the land and people get to protest and people get to say, hey, what about, uh, you know, genetic diversity and biodiversity? And, you know, that's just what happens. Uh, and so that's part of the wonderful fits and starts American process, you know, uh, it mirrors uh, the fact that our, you know, not to get too constitutional on you, but it mirrors the fact that a minority can, you know, hold something up for a bit to say, hey, are you sure? It's, it's really the equivalent of a devil's advocate or sure. someone, uh, like, for example, the Pope, right? They, they always assign a cardinal to argue, the, the smartest one, I'm told, the one that's the most respected to argue the opposite of the position they want to take. And so uh, that's a bit far afield. But so when you see part of it, you know, hanging around, uh, schedule aside, cost, probable cost overruns aside, you know, let's not forget that it's a visionary thing uh, that, that we can do here. Um, and I think ultimately the, they're going to help a lot of efficiencies when they're when they're finally installed. So let, let's let's explore that idea of vision here a little bit. So the the uh, the vision at the uh, of the interstate highways i think is a pretty simple uh, obviously not simple to execute but simple in its concept something that people can grasp the logic of it appeals to us in terms of hey get on the road and go from you know maine to california in 3 or 4 days that's a tremendous thing right there um how would you articulate what the vision should be for this um infrastructure renaissance that you're describing in your book well, it, it depends on what piece you're talking about. For example, okay. uh, you know, there's there's the cyber infrastructure. Okay, uh, that's important. Um, uh, you know, there's the um, of the energy saving parts of the infrastructure that really get passed uh, by dictate. It's by code. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason we have codes as standards. It's because they represent um, the the minimum. Uh, some would say a minimum to which something should be built, uh, and so. Uh, you know, highways are easy now. I mean, let's think about it this way. It's only been 80 years since the system, the highway system was first started. And of course, they're always doing construction on it. Thank yep. goodness. But it's only been 80 years. That's just a generation. Right. That's just one generation, man. Yeah. And so uh, I think one of the things the federal government has done wisely in this most recent infrastructure bill is they let uh, local control predominate. A, uh, you know, San Antonio, for example, here's $500 million. You decide how you want it spent. You know, here's some parameters, but you decide what your community needs. Um, and I think that mirrors part of the genius of the founders of the United States, right? The states get to, uh, you know, run themselves. There's a federal system, but, um, you know, what's acceptable in one state is not acceptable in another and people get to vote. And that's, that's pretty great. I, I I don't disagree with you there. I think um, what 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 I'm curious is um, let let's set aside the the um, you know that dynamic between federal and and state government and local government for a moment. In your mind, what do you think is the number one infrastructure priority that America faces at the moment? So I believe that data collection on habits and efficiencies is a valuable thing to collect. And I think that uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous cities are the wave of the future. 
More people live in cities than live in the country. Uh, smart cities, for example, uh, sensors in a lot of places that can be connected to cars, uh, to transportation, uh, to walkways. Uh, the Autonomy Institute uh, and a guy named Jeff Taku uh, in, in Austin, Texas, uh, a visionary. Uh, you should check out the website. Uh, I have no affiliation. I'd like mm -hmm. to say that. Uh, but the dude is is killing it. And uh, if you'll if you'll take a look at it, uh, you should have him on your show, actually. Hmm. Uh, he's on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, he's uh, given lectures everywhere. But the Autonomy Institute has different packages that cities can select from uh, and menus of things to incorporate in uh, Austin, Texas, for example. I know a lot of my examples are from Texas. I have to believe. Sure, no, it's fine. It's fine, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Austin is in the midst of trying to implement some of the concepts and it's going to help efficiencies uh, and effectiveness. So the next level efficiencies lie in our transportation systems. People are going to move around. It's part of our fabric. There's truckers, there's flights, uh, there's, you know, uh, so much commerce is done along our highways and byways that the increase in efficiency in this system uh, is something we've got to have. Even the railways, as you know, ancient as that technology is, right? It's a railway. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the richest men in the world bet on the railways uh, about a decade ago. Uh, you may have heard of him, Warren Buffett. Sure. He, uh, he knows that transportation via railway is highly efficient. Um, you know, there are buckets that you haul stuff in. Yep. And so, uh, but you can't do that with people uh, super efficiently. And so the car culture is not going anywhere in the U.S. Not anytime soon. No. no. So efficiency uh, via smart cities and smart roads, uh, I think, uh, is the number one thing we can do. That along with energy savings in uh, building design and building construction. Okay, so give us a little bit more there on this idea of data collection on, on people's habits so that those efficiencies can be, can be uh, um, pinpointed. So... People's travel habits, uh, not personal travel habits, but, uh, you know, the big data. The patterns. Uh, travel, right. That helps us to know where we need to build highways. For example, there's a new highway being built that, uh, you know, hooks up two parts of Massachusetts. And it's helping people save fuel. People aren't going to stop driving. Right. They're just not. And so uh, if uh, the roads are efficiently built uh, and they can continually evolve, as to locale, that's the kind of the first step, kind of the, you know, the, on gross observation. Yeah. But as uh, we have more electric cars and more sophisticated cars that are powered differently, but, but with more sensors, we will be able to gather more data uh, that will help us uh, you know, design better cars to get better mileage, uh, uh, better safety features. Uh, if, you know, you'll recall just some years back, there weren't side airbags. Right. And you can probably remember a time when there were no front airbags. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, <laughs> safety. Yeah, of course, you know, uh, my grandfather used to take me around, on, you know, sit me in the middle of on the console and he smoked in the car, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there were ashtrays. I mean, are, are there ashtrays in any cars you've been in lately? Yeah, there, there aren't. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's about the best example I can give you of data collection, uh, because that's not something I specifically uh, sure. get down to the nitty gritty in. Yep. Uh, but that's, that's one example. Eric, hope you're enjoying my chat with Mark here today. If we're going to be able to fix the infrastructure, it means that construction companies have to function well and efficiently. And that is a function of the efficiency and the expertise of your leadership. And that's why my book, Construction Genius, Effective, Hands-On, Practical, Simple, No BS Leadership, Strategy, Sales, and Marketing Advice for Construction Companies can be so useful to you. Do this. This is what a lot of people are doing. They're buying the book for themselves and people in their team, their leadership team. They then read a chapter, let's say a month together, and they discuss it in a short 30 to 45 minute meeting. And through that, they can think about how they can use and apply the strategies that I share in the book to help them to be a better leadership team. And that's the great thing about this book. It is very, very practical. So if you look into the show notes, there will be links where you can click and buy the book on Amazon. There's the Kindle version, the Audible version. There's the soft cover version like I have here. And buy the book for yourself and for the people in your leadership team. You won't regret it. It's an awesome read. And now back to my conversation with Mark. 
Where do you think we're making missteps in terms of our efforts to improve the infrastructure? Where are we missing the, the, the point or where are we just banging our heads up against a wall where we're going to be like, hey, time out, this is not working? Right. So I'll tell you what that is. So people by nature are slow to adapt. Sure. And, you know, people like to be comfortable. And so where we're really missing the boat is we need some experimental expenditures to see what works and what doesn't. Mm. Now, it's no different from Thomas Edison trying to figure out which filament works the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, he went through hundreds and when, when asked, you know, oh my gosh, well, you're just banging your head against the wall. He said, no, I, I have 400 examples I know won't work. Yeah. And so, so you know, uh, we need to engage in a little more experimental uh, uh, design, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, environmental, electronic, with buildings, with transportation to see what does work because only by doing that and proving uh, the concept can we know. Uh, it may sound kind of silly, but the simplest thing is uh, uh, it's, it's very simple, a roundabout. Yes, oh, uh, a roundabout. roundabout. Oh. Yeah, 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 round, yeah, roundabout, you know, I, I didn't used to know them. I didn't like them. They were confusing to me, you know, like a caveman with fire. Yeah, right. And, you know, now I know how to use a roundabout, but, you know, 20 years ago, I'd never seen a roundabout. Yep, yep. Yeah, I'm from Europe, and and so I'm very familiar with with uh, roundabouts. And when they've they've starting to come in in America, and every time I see one, I get all excited. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, look, another roundabout. So. I know, but you, it was a trip. I was down in Pasadena uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, right by my friend's house, there's this this really sweet roundabout. The problem is they've got stop signs. This is so dumb. This is dumb. They have stop signs on each one of the uh, the entrances into the roundabout, which defeats the whole purpose more or less. <laughs> right, and you, that's a great example, right, of something new that people have to learn to utilize, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's just like your chat bot, right? It's new. Uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've used it often and it's, uh, it's awful. It's been awful for me. I mean, I've asked questions and they're wrong and obviously wrong. And, yeah. you know, uh, so, but people have to learn how to use it and make it a habit. Yes. Yes. So that's very interesting because you take something as um, relatively simple. I mean, the concept of a roundabout is a relatively simple one. It, it is a little counterintuitive, but then once you get it, you get it. And, you know, they can just so simply screw it up. Um, what's an example? And, and when we go back to like the World War II example, the, I think the reason why so much innovation happens during wartime is because of the necessity, right? We've got to figure out a, a way to be able to survive and kill the other guy. And so we're going to be as innovative and try stuff out and all this right. kind of stuff. Something about necessity being the mother of, of invention? I don't know. Yeah, there you go. So it's it's interesting because it, it seems in a certain way we, we we're so sort of stuck in this um, a, a sort of a malaise. And maybe it's just my my perspective and I'm off here, but where are you seeing um, this kind of um, experimental expenditure happening that's really moving the ball down the field as it relates to infrastructure that might be pertinent to construction companies? Well, I wish I had more examples okay. uh, for you, uh, but there is one place that uh, isn't, isn't infrastructure focused. Please. That is a great uh, experiment that is happening that is that is succeeding uh, beyond people's wildest dreams, and that is Peter Thiel's one hundred thousand dollars scholarship for people who decide to skip college. Yeah, take a look at what the people that they have uh, chosen for that are achieving. Yeah, take a look at that; it will blow your mind. Yeah, and so uh, and remember, here in the United States, it's a little different from Europe. Um, what you know, a lot of people are expected to go to college. Yeah, and Everyone shouldn't go to college. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, some people are expected to go into the trades and, you know, some of those people shouldn't be in the trades. But the fact is, is that uh, that's where much of the magic happens. Yes. Is, is the trades and, you know, the actual building. Of yes. Things. Yes. You know, some of the most respected German uh, engineers uh, or, or, excuse me, tradesmen build, build Mercedes engines and Porsche engines. And they do it with their hands and they innovate. You know, many discoveries and patents have come out of, of the men and women that work with their hands there. Right. And so uh, so as far as successes, though, the Peter Thiel program uh, has just been astounding. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more press, uh, but it's been absolutely astounding. So I wish there was a laboratory kind of like that or infrastructure. But as it happens, the advances happen in fits and starts. Yes. So. You know, uh, so often, for example, uh, building in building science, more efficiencies uh, are developed at the university level. Yes. Uh, but they're not adopted because 
you know, well, this is the other way that we've always done things and it's going to cost more. And how am I going to do that? And who's going to implement that? And, you know, um, one of the things that has to happen is the men and women responsible for building things who get paid billions of dollars have to embrace change. Yeah. yeah. And they have to maybe make a little less money. Yes. And they have to they have to hire people that don't think like that. Yep. And and, uh, you know, a chief uh, innovation officer at a general contractor. Have yes. you ever heard of one? Uh, I don't know. Maybe there are. They're, they're coming in. They're not exactly named that, but there's the larger general contractors. They're beginning to very much think in these ways, very much so. Okay, good, good, good. That's great to hear. And so, you know, hiring hiring someone that, that thinks differently from you in an organization like that is a big key to, you know, trying new things. And of course, the owner has to agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, most owners are pretty forward thinking and they can afford a $2 million, uh, you know, uh, problem. If it's a choice they made that, well, not going to work out, but we gave it the old college try, you know. Well, you see that that I would push back against that, Mark, because I from, from talking with construction companies, one of the big challenges is I have an owner and I've got a new way of doing a project, but it's going to maybe take a little more time and cost a little bit more money. And the owner's like, no, nah, I just want my building built. You yeah. know, and and here, like in California, for instance, I know that we've got to build it to code. So that's it's interesting what you were saying. By regulation, there's this innovation happening um, because because if you don't do it, then you, your building won't pass inspection. But but the many owners are just doing the bare essentials, and I think that's where it 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 then falls back on the contractors, the GCs, and the subs to be able to. Um, be in a secure enough position where they're not just going from project to project, but they can then set aside time, money, human capital to look at these innovations and begin to think about how they can implement these kinds of changes in their business. Right. And, you know, architects are used to being cutting edge, right? I mean, yeah. you know, I'm an architect. Uh -huh. we, know, we know what that means, right? Uh, both the good and the bad. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, uh, I'm an engineer. I'm here to help you, right? We yeah, right. also know that comes with good and bad. And then also, to be fair, you know, let's be equally fair to everybody, you know, general contractors, yep. um, you know, we'd like to do this one a little different. Well, how much is that going to cost me? Yep. Um, you know, so, you know, everyone's trying to do their best, but, but innovation can happen. Um, you know, despite owners uh, reticence, I think sometimes, but, but by and large hiring people that, that think differently from you are something general contractors can do and still meet most of the owner's requirements. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, from a utility standpoint. Okay, so let's let's do a sort of a wave our magic wand. Um, let's assume by by some sort of miracle that that we we get the the funding mechanisms right. There's enough political will, vision, and leadership, and there's that balance between the federal and the states and the locals, or, or it begins to 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 get worked out. What what are the main innovations that you see happening in the next ten to twenty years in infrastructure that construction companies need to be aware of so that they can get ahead of the curve, so to speak, and make sure that they're there to help build those projects? So the number one is computer aided fill in the blank. Um, you know that's a big deal. Uh, there's economies of scale that can be achieved there in some uh, disciplines, in some respects. Uh, number one, number two, you know buildings an infrastructure that doesn't use as much energy. And I'm talking about enclosures now meant for uh, work or manufacturing, industrial uh, or play. Yep. So enclosures that use less energy, um, you know, uh, that's a huge thing that simply has to happen. And, and, if, and if we don't do it soon, well, we're going to have to do it at some point. Okay. Uh, probably not in our lifetimes, but, you know, that's got to happen. Okay. Um, you know, and more energy efficiency. And I know there's lead certifications and, and stuff like that, but, you know, we're, we're beyond that now. I mean, that's, that's a nice gold star to have. Uh, I frankly question if some of the stuff that has it is really, I don't think it is. I know it's not, but, uh, but going forward, that the biggest thing is the energy efficiencies. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, and I, you'll have to forgive me. I forgot your exact question, but if I could wave my magic wand, we need more skilled labor. Yep. You know, there's just not enough skilled labor. Um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, here in Texas, I can tell you some of the most skilled craftsmen I've seen in my life, uh, you know, come up from Mexico and then, and then go back home, you know, sometimes, sometimes they stay, but there's not a million of those guys. man. Yep. There's not. And uh, skilled labor is something we need from people who care uh, about the work they do. And, and, you know, that's the business I'm in. I mean, I see, I see what happens when things go wrong and, and, 
Uh, and so it's it's easy to know that there's just not enough skilled labor out there to get the work done. You know, we're always looking forward in terms of the um, the development of technologies and new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things. We at the beginning of the, the interview, we glanced back at, at you know, the 1940s and 50s with the, the building of the um, American highway system. What are some other specific lessons from the past that we might lay hold of where there was a tremendous change in terms of technology that impacted infrastructure that we should be looking at as case studies for how we should be moving forward in terms of developing our infrastructure in the present day? So I guess your question is, if I can uh, turn it around and rephrase it. Please. A bit. So the, uh, what, have, what has the construction industry learned in the past that it must embrace more in the future. Yeah, or what are what are some examples of where there is some radical? Because we talked about the highway system, that was a radical infrastructure change. What are some other radical infrastructure changes that are, that have occurred that would be analogous to where we need to go and might help us in the way that we think about uh, the changes we need to make? Well, from a power standpoint, there's been huge advances in power generation, power efficiencies. You know, we talked a little bit about the the power grids and how everybody receives their power. Um, you know, there's been huge innovation in wind energy. Yep. Um, you know, sure, there's some uh, some stories about it not working out, but by and large, uh, it is efficient. It does work out. Uh, you've seen the wind farms, I know, in California. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, there's much more to be done there with uh, the constant motion of the sea uh, insofar as capturing and transmitting energy. So there's a lot of that going on. It hasn't all of which, or at least most of which, hasn't trickled down yet to a lot of folks. But there's, there's uh, what we've learned, though, is, is the answer is not the same for everybody when it comes to power. Right. Uh, and so sometimes it, it, the answer may be nuclear, sometimes, which we haven't embraced, but Europe has. Uh, by the way, China's building, I think, 28 nuclear power plants in the next five, six, five to yep. seven years. Yep. Uh, and you can bet they'll be finished uh, Absolutely. in five to seven years. So, <laughs> but, but where we get our power and how we get it uh, and then how we use it is really the fundamental thing that drives every single bit of what we do. Because without power, to power the drills, to power the steam shovels, uh, you know, to make the steel, uh, to help mix the concrete, it all goes back to local. And we start living in city states and villages. So yeah. without the power that we have and all the dependence we have, it's generation and delivery. Uh, you know, um, you'll see nations crumble if those uh, answers aren't, aren't, aren't sought out and uh, solved. If you were to articulate, if you could, a, a vision for the infrastructure of the United States in a simple phrase or sentence that most people could understand, how would you do that? Well, we've got to do what works, what we have found works in the past, and we have to uh, discard what doesn't. We have to be extremely utilitarian about uh, and realistic about what works and what doesn't for different parts of the country. Uh, and for that, I'm talking about every part of the infrastructure, whether it's power, whether it's, um, you know, uh, roads and bridges, uh, whether it's, um, you know, our waterways. We have to embrace what works and discard what doesn't and understand that different regions and different, uh, maybe even cities will have different solutions, perhaps. Right. And one size doesn't really fit all. Okay. So, so let me ask you this then, how can a construction company owner, because what, what happens many times I, I think is that construction company owners um, by nature are reactive to what's coming from, you know, regulations, what's coming from the, the economy. And there's, that, that's very appropriate, but how can a, how can a construction company owner or president become proactive in light of getting on the front foot when it comes to these infrastructure changes that are going to be occurring? So I, I have to start this answer by telling you that I believe folks that build stuff are a different breed mm -hmm. uh, because it's always amazed me at its most basic that that uh, a person with a pickup and a shovel can and you know can build something just wonderful. That's right. Uh, whether it's a house, whether it's a you know you name it, because I've seen it happen. I've seen huge companies start off with a guy with a shovel and a pickup truck. That's right. And so <laughs> it's it's miraculous, and it and it gets down to. Uh, excuse me, it gets down to will and it gets down to vision. Uh -huh. And so you and I both know that every, every, every person, and I'll say guy listening to this podcast who is in the general contracting business is focused on where's my next project coming from? That's right. How do, I, how do I close out the last? Yes. So, you know, that's no different than a man uh, or a woman knowing I've got to have food and water. Yes. So those are the first two things and you can't begrudge them that. 
But but what they need to know is, is that if they will just somehow, some way, think about things in a little different way, uh, maybe take a different approach from time to time, maybe the next uh, building they build can be more energy efficient. How do they measure that? How can they brag about it? Uh, I mean, wouldn't you like to be the first guy on your general contractor metaphorical block uh, to build, uh, you know, build a better mousetrap to, yep. to, you know, have tweak something to figure it out. But, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough task because in many senses, you know, construction is a simple thing, you know, building envelope, although it's, it, it can be an engineered structure, you know, it's not complicated. You know, uh, there's no weight to thrust ratio that needs to be calculated. Like when you're launching a rocket, um, but they, they need to, you know, make friends with the local university construction science guys, you know, there you go. talk about what they've heard of, yep. uh, you know, go to dinner with them. Um, those are friends that will broaden your horizons. Um, you know, you could hire them as a, you know, a little bit of a consultant here and there. They'd like that. You certainly got the money for it because, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of money to be made uh, in, in building stuff, yep. uh, which is great. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say get to be friends with your local, um, you know, university building science guy. You know, pick a couple that you like, uh, you know, or gal and, you know, ask them, you know, let them be the person that helps you think differently. I think it's interesting, too, that that th the best contractors I find are the most innovative ones are the ones who they embrace the political realities that we've been describing here. And, and they really seek to build relationships at the local level, at the state level, and if possible, at the federal level, so that they can have at least some influence through associations or through their personal relationships that can help to drive some of that infrastructure spending in a particular direction. Yeah, and I agree with you. Those are the most effective because they have people skills. They can see over the horizon. And, uh, you know, in its most basic level, it's uh, send some money our way so we can build some cool stuff for the people that live near me. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's right. So, Mark, tell us a little bit more about the work that you do and, and how people can get, can get in touch with you. You know, Eric, so uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, I have a national practice. And all I do uh, in that practice is, well, two things. I represent owners. I don't represent general contractors. I don't represent architects or engineers. I only represent owners for construction defects and delays. Uh -huh. And I only work on a contingent fee basis. Mm -hmm. I'm the only lawyer of my type uh, that I know of. Uh, um, and the second part of my practice is I also represent owners, institutional owners, uh, large property owners against their insurance companies when they have a covered insurance loss and the insurance company uh, won't make them whole. And uh, let me tell you what, we are busy, busy, busy. <laughs> we are busy, busy, busy. I represent uh, you know, high rises, museums, uh, you know, large hospital systems. Um, and so the key to what I do is on the, on the construction defect side is I help the general contractors liability insurance carrier understand that it needs to pay. Right. We're typically not after what I call the general contractors, real money. Uh -huh. you know, they've got some uh, retainage or hold back the road. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not there to get that, but uh, I know how to trigger the insurance coverage they have to make it as, you know, as, as least painful as I can for everybody. Sure. Sure. So I know you've heard me say glowing things about general contractors today and, and, you know, wonderful architects and, you know, wonderful engineers, and there's many good people. And, you know, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you're a, you know, a bad person, of course, because people do make mistakes and that's why we have insurance. So my job is recovering cost to prepare for owners for non-conforming work. Tremendous. And then how did that all lead to you writing that book, Reframing America's Infrastructure? Well, uh, you know, so we represent owners all the time in all facets, uh, you know, uh, large projects, uh, you know, massive projects, medium projects. And it just began to come together for me that uh, that the infrastructure uh, here in America is such an important part of everything we do. It's such a part of our nation. And I, I knew a lot of examples of poor construction. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, one reviewer, you can go to Carcass Reviews and read the review, uh, which is easier than reading the book. Uh, so I'd encourage you to go to Carcass and check out the review. But Carcass says that uh, Gravely cites an unnerving number of examples of poor construction. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the stuff that makes it to the news. Yeah. So uh, there's a thousand footnotes. Um, uh, so 
there wasn't a book out there like this. And uh, if you can find one, I'd love to see it. But uh, it was uh, my COVID project, I guess I could say. Uh, and so I decided to write a book about, you know, the soaring vision of what America's infrastructure could be. Uh, talk about a little bit about the history of infrastructure in ancient societies. Uh, you know, there's still Roman bridges standing today that are used. Yep. Uh, you know, I talk about uh, a lot of problems uh, uh, with, because, you know, conflict is popular. So I talk about a lot of uh, construction problems. There's a bunch of examples. Then I talk about some of the visionaries. Uh, that will help pull us through this uh, in my book, uh, Dr. Michael Larinaga, uh, who helped calculate uh, uh, risks of uh, multiple pipelines uh, in, in the Western U.S. Uh, Jeffrey Deku from Autonomy Institute are some of the visionaries I talk about in the book. Hmm. That's excellent. That's excellent. And how can how can people get in touch with you? Uh, they can email me, mgravely at gravely.law. You can go to gravely.law. Uh, I've got a new website popping up in about 30 days. Uh, but, you know, uh, people are free to email me with questions. Uh, I've got a couple of free books on the site they can download. One is called Construction Quality Audits. Hmm. It's free to download. It's a it's a service, free service we offer to owners. We'll come in after a building's finished, after the punch list, and do a quality audit and then give a report to the owner. That's cool. Uh, and then there's another book or two about, uh, you know, how to pursue hospital defects, uh, cost repair recovery. Excellent. Excellent. Um, last question I have. I know that you've uh, litigated before the Texas Supreme Court a number of times. Um, tell us your, your most interesting experience while you were doing that. I have. So we represented policyholders against insurance companies for property damage at the Supreme Court, uh, either as amicus counsel or party counsel uh, uh, about that many times. And so one of my most interesting cases was uh, uh, we represented a group of trade groups and the insurance industry was trying to get some policy language changed so they didn't have to pay as much money. Hmm. And so our clients included the Texas Hospital Association, Texas Hotel and Lodging Association. At that point, the Texas Apartment Association, cities and counties, uh, uh, even the independent bankers, to let the Supreme Court know that, that please don't give in to the industry. People pay billions in premiums every year in Texas. You know, please don't rule the way they were ruling. And, and so we, we uh, were able to, uh, I believe, greatly influence uh, the court uh, and bring some bring some uh, gravitas, I like to think, to bear to let everyone know what all these property owning trade groups uh, thought who you know, spent billions of dollars a year in premiums. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Mark, I really appreciate you joining me today on Construction Genius. I'll make sure there's links in the show notes to your website and to your book. And um, thanks again for giving us your insights here today. Thanks, Eric. Take care, man. You too. Hey, this is Eric. Thank you for listening to my interview with Mark Gravely. Make sure you check out his book, Reframing America's Infrastructure, A Ruins to Renaissance Playbook. There are links in the show notes to the book and to Mark's website. Feel free to connect with him. And as always, share the show with other people who you think would benefit from listening to it. Appreciate you listening to Construction Genius, and I'll catch you on the next episode.